The Premed Year, session number 350. Hello, and welcome to The Premed Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially, must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given to me to save a life, all thanks. But it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with great humbleness and awareness of my own frailty. Above all, I must not play at God. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being, whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I am to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, though sound of mind and body as well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. This is the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath, written in 1964 by Dr. Louis Lasagna. I recite this modern version of the Hippocratic Oath every 50 episodes, and, well... Today's episode 350. And so you got to hear it again. If you've been listening for a while, you've heard it a few times now. If you haven't heard it before, well, you have some more episodes to go listen to, but that's okay. You've got plenty of time. I hope that this reading of the Hippocratic Oath kind of gives you a little bit of motivation. A lot of people write me, let me know that it brought a tear to their eye, that they remember why they're doing this, that it just gives them some more motivation some more encouragement, some more drive to continue forward. Now, the Hippocratic Oath is something that you recite during your white coat ceremony when you start medical school, when you're given a white coat by the medical school. And it's something that you should hold near and dear to your heart. Now, just a word of, not a warning, but just a a note. Nowhere in there did you hear, first, do no harm. That's not in the Hippocratic Oath. That was somewhere else by someone else. So maybe it was Hippocrates. I I forget exactly where it came from. But first, do no harm is not in the Hippocratic Oath. So with that said, today I'm talking to Dr. Marty McCary, a surgical oncologist and the chief of the Johns Hopkins Islet Transplant Center at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And today we are not really talking about his role as a surgeon But we're going to be talking about the book that he wrote, the second book, at least, that he wrote, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. This is an interesting discussion on healthcare, something that you're going to need to understand for your medical school interviews, something that you're going to need to understand as a future physician, not something that you necessarily have to dive into and know everything about, but something that you should try to understand, at least from a superficial level. And if you are going into healthcare, something that I think you should want to know about. This is something that is going to be changing all of the time as you 
as you enter healthcare, it's something that the, the only thing that remains constant is change in healthcare, uh, depending on who is running the government at the current time, something that frustrates me to no end with the way that our healthcare system is set up, our government system is set up, but that's what happens. And I have a great discussion with Marty today about healthcare and his thoughts on healthcare and how we got here and where we're going from here. You may not agree with everything that we talk about today, and I don't necessarily agree with everything that Dr. McCary talked about, but it was interesting, and I hope you go check out his book. You can pre-order it as this episode comes out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you get your books. It is coming out September 10th, 2019, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare, and How to Fix It. Marty, welcome to The pre Years. Thanks for joining me. Great to be with you, Ryan. So when did you first realize, we're going to way back in time, when did you first realize that you wanted to be a physician? Well, it's one of those things where I got a chance to see how much people respected physicians. You know, being a physician is still the most respected profession in the world. And when you have a father or a relative or you go in as a patient and you see that people will tell anything to the doctor, secrets they've never told anybody in their life, mm. or trust a doctor to put a knife to their skin within seconds of meeting them just because they're the doctor. I mean, how can you not look at that and say, that is awesome. That public trust that this profession has built over the years with sort of a, a, a embodiedness in a sense of equality of, of humans, you know, that anyone regardless of who they are, their race, creed, ability to pay, whatever, we will take care of you. That's awesome. So that that's what I uh, saw early in it. And that's what I love about the job. And how did you choose the specialty to go into? <laughs> well, originally, I thought maybe I'll be a missionary doctor, um, like a lot of people going into medical school. Mm -hmm. And there's something very appealing early on about trying to learn everything in medicine, right? So uh, someone had told me, if you want to go into the field, that is to work overseas with poor people, you can read the internal medicine or the pediatrics that you need to learn, but you can't read the surgical skills. You've got to train in those skills. So if you want to be a real true generalist and be prepared to go overseas, um, do a surgical residency, and then you can, you know, uh, use that as the basis of your knowledge foundation. I also um, found that there was a lot of, and forgive me, but a lot of pontificating in medicine, a lot of sort of, let's, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about every one of the 200 possibilities of what this might be. And there was something appealing to the surgical field about fixing things and having sort of a surgical approach of let's go with the most likely thing. We've got to act fast. We've got to get ahead of this and let's address it. So um, the operating room is a cool place. It's a little intimidating at first. Had some good mentors. Um, but I think uh, surgery is still a terrific profession. It's an incredible career. Um, and so, um, I have the highest respect for those who go into psychiatry, medicine, pediatrics, office-based specialties. I mean, it's hard work. And I think, um, that sometimes is in my mind, the harder, uh, task in medicine is to listen to people, to diagnose, to coordinate care. And being a surgeon is almost sort of the, uh, the easier road, you know, we can focus in the operating room on one thing, block everything else out of our minds and really practice a, um, a manual craft. When along this journey, did you say, I, I think I'm going to write some books and be an author and, and go down that <laughs> path because, because, you know, being a surgeon, just, I, I have so much free time. <laughs> well, I think you see, um, the reason to write a book is if you believe that there is a story that needs to be told that nobody else is telling. And going through medicine, we, you know, we become sort of conditioned in pre-med education, in medical school, in residency, the whole process, there's a, there's a psychological conditioning. And I think 
when people see that conditioning and see that, hey, some of this stuff is good, some of it is bad, some of it is unhealthy, some of it really creates a, a philosophy or a construct that is kind of dangerous. And this medical system that we have can be awesome and it can be uh, daunting and even dangerous. So I got interested early on in the subject of medical errors. And it just baffled me that people could die not just from the disease or illness that brings them to care, but from the care itself. And I had an opportunity at um, Harvard to work with some of the early pioneers who were, who were creating this new field of medicine called patient safety. So I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by the, the military example. You would appreciate this as an Air Force guy. That Kevlar was invented long before it actually had an impact in saving lives because even though it was invented, people were not wearing it. And it was actually the um, implementation science of getting people to wear it that made it effective. And in medicine, we have all these great ironies, right? And I think modern medicine today is missing the boat on so many important things on food as medicine, on meditation, on um, treating the big public health issues of our day like loneliness, things that don't even get mentioned. Yet loneliness affects people's health. We don't talk about frailty and physiological reserves. So these are the issues that I think are the exciting things right now. And I love the students I work with at Johns Hopkins. They think about these things. They ask hey, can we treat hypertension with yoga as a first-line therapy <laughs> and save medications for people that don't respond to that? Uh, can we treat arthritis with a low inflammatory diet? Can we talk about the microbiome as a reason for abdominal pain? These are things that modern medicine has not been able to process or understand. Generally speaking, the medical establishment that you and I trained under, Ryan, has had this construct, which is an artificial construct. I don't even think it's true. It's to say, look, we don't have any studies on what you're asking about. Therefore, there's no evidence. Therefore, it's not true. Yeah. And that deductive reasoning is not lo logical. It's not correct. It's not at all. And yeah. it's been very dangerous. Yeah. I, I, I try to explain that to a lot of people and, and I use real examples. Uh, and, and unfortunately, my family and I have have a lot of health issues and something I've talked about on the podcast before with uh, my wife having Crohn's disease, she uh, tested negative for celiac, right? But I said, let's let's just cut out gluten and see, right? You have Crohn's disease. Let's let's try something that a lot of people are doing. And her symptoms disappeared when she cut out gluten. Right. But she tested negative for celiac. And so, of course, she doesn't have uh, a celiac. Right. In, in, in that construct that you mentioned. But the way that I look at it is, well, maybe she has a form of celiac that we just can't test for right now. And in five years and 10 years, maybe we'll find another protein that causes celiac or celiac like symptoms. And it's it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I think um, too many students do. They fall back on that. Residents and physicians fall back on, well, I, I don't have any data, so it's not true. <laughs> exactly. I don't have any data, so it's not true. I mean, how many times do we hear that, right? Now, if you, if you get shot in the left atrium of the heart, you want to be in the United States. You want to be in one of our great American hospitals, and we will take care of you better than any place in the world. But if you come in with chronic abdominal pain, Oh. Sometimes modern medicine doesn't know what to do with you. Yeah. Right? And it's that it's that fallacy that there's no study, therefore there's no evidence, therefore it's not true. And that is something we need to challenge. And young people are challenging it. That's what I love about our students. They're saying, hey, Crohn's disease, isn't it interesting that there was no such thing of Crohn's disease before 1920 when antibiotics were introduced? Mm. Isn't it interesting that Crohn's disease doesn't exist in other parts of the world that have not adopted the, the Western diet? Isn't it interesting that the human biome is altered with antibiotics every time some kid has the sniffles or acne 
and they're told, hey, take these antibiotics. We're like throwing napalm down that microbiome, <laughs> yeah. which needs to be in an equilibrium. And we do all these things to throw it into a disequilibrium. You know, all this stuff, modern processed food, uh, antibiotics, you name it, all this stuff we throw down the pipes. And then we're shocked that we have a new inflammatory disease that the modern world has created called, called Crohn's disease. I mean, we have created a whole host of conditions, not we physicians, but society and medicine has been in this sort of rut where they can't, you know, um, talk about these root problems because of that logic. There's no study. There's therefore there's no evidence. Therefore, it's not true. And I think all we need to do is take a step back. And a lot of these things are obvious. Like, why do why do we why did doctors recommend everyone should drink four glasses of milk? a day. Where did that come from? <laughs> the milk industry. Milk. <laughs> the milk industry, right? And when you ask, hey, why are we pushing milk so hard? They'll tell you it's an important source of calcium, of vitamin D, <laughs> calcium, yeah. even though that is it's added to the milk. It doesn't naturally <laughs> occur in the milk. These things are messing up the human biome, yeah. right? So now we're starting to talk about these things. And thank God for students who come in and say, Hey, this doesn't seem right. Okay, why are we um, um, telling everybody to avoid fat? And there's no science to say that fat <laughs> is a, saturated fat causes heart disease. Yeah, and so we're seeing this sort of new generation questioning a lot of the stuff we're doing. I mean, the opioid epidemic isn't uh. that one manifestation of a manufactured crisis by the modern medical industrial complex. And it's one manifestation of the problem of too much medical care, or if you really want to break it down, medical errors. Mm -hmm. So it's an exciting time right now in medicine. We're breaking stuff down. We're doing it with students. We need fresh minds. We need a new outlook. We need to disrupt this sort of medical establishment that's told us, get in line and don't question this. And there's there's no science, therefore there's no evidence, therefore there's no, it's not true. How does a student do that though? Because the the construct of our medical education is that there's a hierarchy. And if you fall out of line, then your potential of getting a good residency, your potential of getting a good fellowship, getting a job may be at jeopardy because of how much we, we rely on uh, recommendation letters and feedback from attendings. And, and if a student comes along and challenges uh, potentially an attending during rotations as a third year medical student, then that, that attending could have uh, some potential consequences for the student. Yeah, it's a real barrier, right? And so as a student, you want to link up with the docs who you really feel you, that you have good chemistry with, not just interpersonal skills, but in terms of philosophical chemistry. You, it's amazing how many docs are, are along the same lines. We are questioning why we are doing things a certain way. There are doctors now saying, look, 20 to 30% of everything we do in medicine is unnecessary. A statistic that we recently validated in a uh, research study, which was a survey of U.S. physicians um, and these are students doing this research. And so you want to find somebody with good chemistry. Just real quick, some important tips. When we have pre-med students and medical students watching us in surgery, first of all, we like hyper communicators. Okay, we like people who ask a lot of questions, not just, oh, I read this. There, what, um, Oh, you're going to the emergency room? Would you like me to come with you or wait here? Can I help you lift that patient onto the stretcher? Would you like me to go see if that other person is available. You, did you want me to remind you about this later on today? The hyper communicators are annoying in the real world outside the hospital, but in medicine, they are very effective. <laughs> they, that is the skill set that we like, is the hyper communicators. We don't just like the guy who is quiet and stands there like a sphinx and thinks, <laughs> I'm not saying anything, therefore, I must be doing a good job because I'm staying out of the way. We like people who are hyper communicators. Mm -hmm. My colleague, um, when he interviews people for different um, things, he's looking for somebody who can talk about sports. Why? Because he says, if you can't talk about at least one sport 
then um, he de- then he doesn't feel like he's going to have the sort of connection with you or that you'll be able to connect with people who work in a different area of the hospital. It's a great connector. It doesn't matter if it's billiards or ping pong. He wants to know that a person interviewing can at least talk about a sport. They don't have to know every, you know, Cy Young winner, but he just, that's a sign of affability. We yeah. love, you know, we've had a couple people from Oklahoma recently. They're not the number one person on the MCATs, but they are extremely affable they're hyper communicators, and that's what we like. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Just a couple little tips. I mean, I think you want to find somebody where you have good chemistry, good philosophical chemistry, identify mentors, and um, you know, there are many ways to distinguish yourself as a pre med student. Simply rotating in a hospital and observing is something everybody does, and everybody needs to do. What I like to see is somebody that's thinking big. For example, we have a bunch of pre-med students that joined my Johns Hopkins research team who are helping us defend patients who have been sued by hospitals and cannot afford their medical bill. Mm. Hospitals in the U.S. now are suing, some hospitals are suing patients when they can't afford their medical bill and taking them to court to have their wages garnished so their paychecks are automatically deducted, the money goes straight to the hospital. It's cruel, it's unfair. These are low-income people, many of whom have health insurance. In my opinion, this is wrong. It's the ultimate sort of disgrace of the great medical profession. And the students come up to me, they read our articles, they see my stuff on, you know, the web and they say, Marty, I've been reading about this stuff. This stuff makes me mad. I want to be a part of the solution. What can I do? And we've got students now um, in my research group that have started a movement called Restoring Medicine at restoringmedicine.org. I mean, these are gap year students. These are undergrad, pre-med students, and they're calling things out right? They're part of a generation that believes in social justice, that wants to have a sense of purpose in life. And I think they're finding it in standing up for people who are otherwise voiceless. So these are some really good opportunities I think people have to, you know, join an effort, a cause, a movement. It doesn't matter what it is. We want people with some kind of passion yeah. So what we want to, what we need in medicine is less robotic personalities and more people with passion. So you talked about this this program where students are helping these families who are getting sued, and you wrote a book that's coming out in September: "The Price We Pay: What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It." Now it sounds like. You think that healthcare is broken. And obviously that's one example of, of hospitals saying, hey, we want our money. How would how should a hospital run if it can't get money from patients? Well, first of all, doctors and hospitals need to be paid for their services. We're not saying that, you know, hospitals should just eat the costs of all this medical care. Mm-hmm. But for the love of humanity, suing low-income patients for bills that they simply cannot afford? Yeah. I mean, most hospitals are nonprofit. Most hospitals were started by churches. Most hospitals have a charter at their founding dedicating them to be a safe haven for the sick and injured of the community, regardless of one's race or ethnicity or their ability to to pay, this is the great American heritage of our profession. Medicine has always been an open doors, equal opportunity caregiver. And if we start now um, this sort of rash of predatory billing and surprise bills that are dominating American medicine, it's a disgrace. I've talked to patients who have said, I've been sued twice by the hospital. One time they did tests I didn't even think were necessary. And the other time uh, my kid had asthma and I was so worried for their life. And this person's explaining the situation to me with pain. They actively have this new abdominal pain and they're telling me I'm at home and I'm in pain 
and I'm scared to go to the hospital. That's a disgrace. One quarter of the American public now doesn't trust us anymore. And sometimes it's for good reasons. You know, we've got this um, history, hospitals that make a lot of money, um, who have are putting liens on people's homes. I mean, look at the CEO pay of one hospital, uh, Aurora Advocate Hospital, okay? CEO pay went up $11 million in one year, and that hospital is actively suing patients for unpaid medical bills. I mean, have some compassion. I mean, you, Ryan, and, and myself and my students and my team our hospital administrators in most places in the country, we all went into medicine for one unifying reason, to help people. Okay, where is that compassion? Why do hospitals not pay taxes? Because they're nonprofit organizations that are dedicating to, dedicated to serving communities. What's happening right now in American medicine, the business of price gouging, surprise bills, egregious markups, unnecessary medical care, it's a disgrace to the profession. And, you know, in medical school, Ryan, we're taught medical literacy. We're never taught healthcare literacy. We're never taught the business of medicine. We're only taught the sort of lexicon of being a doctor. Well, we need to know not just medical literacy, we need to know healthcare literacy and that's why I wrote the book, The Price We Pay. I wanted any person, a pre-med student, a gap year student, a medical student to be able to say, you know, I never really understood the business of medicine. It always just seemed so fuzzy to me. There's so many different parts. I wanted them to be able to say, I just read this book and now I finally understand how every part of the healthcare system works. I finally understand the business of medicine. And now I know what's egregious and what's reasonable. There's a massive blame game going on in healthcare right now because of the egregious cause. People want to know who's the problem. Well, guess what? Maybe it's not individuals. Maybe it's the way the system is structured. Maybe it's the way the incentives are aligned. And maybe there are disruptors right now who are completely innovating and redesigning medicine they're completely starting from scratch and building healthcare systems completely from scratch in small towns in America and direct primary care clinics in America. And maybe we can learn from them. And that's why I wrote the book, The Price We Pay. I wanted to both explain the problems and the business medicine and highlight the bright spots, the disruptors who are going to fix it. And it's exciting. I'm very optimistic about the future of medicine. It's been a great journey writing this book, The Price We Pay, and I'm very excited about it. It's it's interesting. A pre-med student listening to this may hear what you're saying and go, oh, well, shoot, I didn't know healthcare was that bad or medicine was that bad. Why, why am I going into it? And it sounds like with as much as you are calling out the, the healthcare industry, it sounds like you are still passionate for healthcare and want to see it uh, improve and change and have that disruption. So for the pre-med student listening to this, what would you say to him or her to to encourage them that this is still an amazing field? Yes, there are issues, um, but there it's still an amazing field and you should come and join us and and join the fight to improve things. We need your help. Look, medicine right now is on the brink of having its its incredible public trust eroded by these egregious predatory billing practices, predatory screening practices of overtreatment and problems ranging from over medicating to spending, you know, 10 minutes with a patient and trying to address their complex issues. Medicine was never intended to be like this. No one ever intended the game that hospitals and insurance companies play to mark up a bill and then give them a, give insurance companies a secret discount. And they, the hospitals year after year mark up the bill more. And then they give a bigger discount to the insurance companies and they mark up the bill more the next year and give a bigger discount. All of a sudden, the Amish person that walks in, the person who gets an out-of-network 
service at an in-network hospital, the person with a high deductible is getting hammered with that sticker price high bill. No one ever intended the money games of medicine to have this many uh, consequences on everyday hardworking Americans. I'll tell you this, we need people now to go into medicine and stand up for what's right. We need students, we need creative people, we need people who believe in the mission of medicine and its great medical heritage, because uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle right now. When you have, um, you know, businesses who that cannot compete anymore with businesses overseas because of healthcare, that is an American tragedy, right? It's burdening the entire country. We don't have money for schools and education and other important national priorities because of all the taxpayer dollars getting shunted towards healthcare. If you saw the movie The Big Short. Uh, it did a great job of explaining the banking crisis. And if you remember, the banks had told the public for years leading up to the 2008 crisis, hey, look, banking is very complex. Leave it to us. We are the experts. And these are very complex systems. Well, guess what? It wasn't complex. It was as simple as banks spending money they didn't have on toxic loans that they should have never been giving out. It was that simple. Meanwhile, the independent ratings agencies were being paid to give a rating, and therefore they had a conflict of interest and were giving artificially inflated ratings. The system actually was broken in some very simple ways, and it eventually collapsed. Well, that's exactly what's happening with healthcare. These money games are very fixable. The solution sometimes is embarrassingly simple. We need public transparency of the secret negotiated prices between hospitals and insurance companies. There should be no secrecy in healthcare. That's my firm belief. We should have honest billing practices. Billing quality should be a part of hospital quality in the way that we measure hospitals and rank them. When you search a hospital on Google, you should be able to see what their average markup is and what their score is on billing honesty. And these are some common sense American transparency based solutions that we can implement. We need more students and doctors now to say, hey, these things are important to restore the public trust of medicine that has been eroded by this sort of predatory billing practices and overtreatment. I think it's an exciting time. I go through a lot of these disruptors the movement to restore medicine back to its mission. It, it is an extremely exciting time. And the best part of my job as a surgeon at Johns Hopkins are these students, the, the, the medical students, the gap year students, the pre-med undergrad students, the residents, the faculty members who come up to, came up to me and said, you know, Marty, I'm sick of just sort of towing the party line and giving out the corporate speak about I don't know how much this is going to cost to my, telling that to patients. We should know how much it costs and we should stand behind our quality. So it's an exciting time right now uh, in medicine. And of course, we're very close to Washington, D.C. And my yeah. team gets to go to uh, Congress and even sometimes the White House and different places where we get to talk to policymakers and tell them these are the stories of our patients and people are getting hammered out there right now. Please listen to their stories. And we're seeing legislation and new, you know, action by, uh, by policy leaders. It's an extremely exciting time. I'm very optimistic about the future. Do you think that these changes can be made slowly over time, small incremental changes here and there? Or do we need a complete reboot of our healthcare system and, and move to something like what Canada has or what England has or, or some other just drastic change in, in how we do things? Well, I'll tell you, um, one of the guys I highlight in the book, The Price We Pay, basically was working in a primary care clinic and was just kind of like, uh, are we really seeing patients for 10 to 12 minutes each all day long? Like this is for the birds. This is completely broken. I don't want to have anything to do with this. 
he left, took a bunch of doctors and started a clinic that is now a globally capitated, or in other words, they're paid in a lump sum so they don't have to bill. And it's what they call a relationship clinic. Relationship-based primary care medical clinics are taking off in America right now. It is so exciting. We've seen Iora Health and Oak Street Health and ChenMed, these fast-growing primary care clinics around the country. I mean, some of these clinics are 20, 30 uh, clinic systems now. They're growing like weeds, and people love them because they're spending time with the doctors. The doctors love it because they can spend time getting into the real issues with their patients. You know, you don't need somebody with a formal degree as a nurse practitioner or a physician to do a lot of the great health navigation and health coaching that patients need. When somebody comes in lonely or has diabetes or hypertension, I could take a really super motivated college student. I could take a, a kinesiology major or an econ major. And if they are driven by empathy and they have a work ethic to do whatever it takes to do a good job, we can take those talented individuals and teach them what they need to do so that the di patient with diabetes can learn how to cook to keep her sugar down. We can teach that student how to take somebody with severe depression and treat it not with medication, but instead with community. And we're seeing these clinics, the Ioras and Chen Meds and Oak Street Health Clinics, take talented individuals, sometimes not even with a formal medical degree, and teach them how to hold a patient's hand and care for them under the direction of a physician or a, or a clinical practitioner. But we're seeing this tremendous movement now to move medical care out of these big hospital buildings with complicated parking garages and check-in procedures at the door and into communities where these health coaches and navigators and sometimes doctors and nurses go to the home and they meet at a community center and they teach a cooking class and they have a yoga studio. And we're seeing um, people now say, we can completely redesign medical care from scratch and make it better if you free us from the bondage of this billing treadmill, 10, pa 10 minute patient visits, that probably accounts for a lot of the overtreatment. And it's very exciting. Yeah. I, I think the, the billing side is, is what gets most people. It's like, well, I, I, how am I going to bill for going to someone's house or going to a community center and, and teaching someone to cook? I, I can't bill for that. Therefore I can't do it. <laughs> well, I think you'll hear this a lot. Burnout rates in medicine are at record high levels. But I would not let that discourage any student from going into the profession. Why? Because now there's a movement to reclaim medical care and to redesign healthcare from scratch and to do it in a way that both allows us to enjoy our jobs as doctors and allows us to meet patients where they're at. So, for example, um, the billing stuff, right? The stuff that drives us crazy. We can redesign care. So that payment is behind the scenes to, for a population and we don't have to pay, we don't have to bill for every Band-Aid that we recommend, right? Guess what? Patients love it and doctors love it. Um, take, for example, the idea that um, patients want care close to them. We've got telemedicine. We've got ways to take care of our own physicians so they work shifts and work as teams. So I think we're just seeing a whole bunch of new ways of looking at care that are very exciting. You know, people look at burnout rates in medicine and they say, well, the emergency room has high burnout rates. Radiology has high burnout rates. Do you know what drives a lot of that burnout? It's not the, the trauma and the patients that, you know, the, the hard work. No, doctors want to work hard, right? They've been doing it their whole lives. They want to work hard. What burns them out is the lack of any follow-up, the, 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 lack of any loop that's closed where the patient actually says thank you at the end of the process. Emergency room doctors don't get that, right? They don't get the thank yous. They don't get the, 
loops that are closed. Same with radiology, two of the fields that have some of the highest burnout rates. It's not the trauma. The trauma is when they, you know, turn it on and dial it up and go to work and focus and concentrate. And, you know, they're happy to do that intense work. It's the, all the other stuff in the system that we can fix. You know, doctors have an, an incredible history of solving problems and you're seeing it right now. And that's why I loved writing the book, The Price We Pay is, is, is uh, I had an opportunity to watch so many of these uh, inventors, if you will, doctor innovators who are redesigning care in a way that's so logical, you realize that the solution is embarrassingly simple. We just have to start from scratch and get rid of all these things that we just assume we have to do in healthcare, like billing. So for the pre-med student listening to this, who who is like, okay, I'm on board. I still want to do this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm signed up. What should they be doing to start to get involved? Uh, well, I guess first to get educated, but then to get involved to to start advocating for these changes. Well, I think first of all, keep your passion. We need passionate students, and we need them to have a real deep sense of purpose in going into medicine. But second of all, if the idea of practicing medicine all day long sounds daunting, just remember, most people now are planning on some kind of hybrid career. That is, you can be a physician and be a, an author. You can be a physician and be a, a community <laughs> podcaster. You can, yeah. I mean, honestly, there are so, and you're doing great work because we need to message better in medicine, right? We've lost some of the public we, in Baltimore. There are people, you know, who live near Johns Hopkins Hospital who don't trust the hospital. We have patients who come in from the community, and when the doctor explains things, the patient doesn't understand what they're talking about, right? So messaging what we do in medicine is as important as what we do sometimes. We have strong feelings in medicine about being an advocate for our patients, if we just keep writing in the medical journals, guess what? We're only talking to ourselves. When we start writing in the Wall Street Journal and USA Today and you know, do podcasts like you're doing, Ryan, we get the word out there. And I think you're seeing whole new approaches to health promotion that are really exciting. I mean, it's a really good time right now. For the student listening to this, they're probably four, five, six, seven, eight years away from actually being out and and working in a residency and, and getting their training as a physician. What sort of environment are they going to be stepping into, do you think? I think it's going to get better. I think things are going to be, be getting better. Now, look, when these old-timer doctors or even mid-career doctors are saying, don't go into medicine now, it's not the profession it was, well, you got to remember, they were in, an, in a golden era of medicine where you could do anything you want at any time, sometimes with no accountability and no real good documentation. And now we've got... Uh, and and just, get paid very well for it. <laughs> and they got paid. I mean, they got rich. I mean, these were. Yep. J- j- this was an era... When I mean, I know surgeons that made millions of dollars a year in that golden era of medicine. Okay. When they say, oh, it's not the way it was, guess what? You don't have to make millions of dollars a year. You can have a great life. And I think now people are realizing the young folks are coming through and they're saying, look, I don't have a problem logging on to the electronic health record. That's just how we keep track of patients. I don't have a problem doing this thing or that thing the hospital wants me to do. It's just part of, you know, the business of medicine. So I think you're seeing, a, a, you know, a, a past generation sort of mourn the golden era of medicine. But I think medicine is still a ter- an incredible profession. If you're a pre-med student and you really want to do this, do something that follows your passion in terms of you know, involvement in the profession, get involved. I mean, we have so many students involved in our work with restoringmedicine.org. We hear students all the time who are doing their own 
helping to help parts of the healthcare system, getting involved in a nursing home, redesigning care, developing an app. I mean, there are so many ways now that you can get involved in healthcare without actually just standing around the hospital. Um, so I think there's a lot of good opportunities out there. How can a student learn more about what you and your team are doing and, and the books that you have out? Well, I've written a couple books. Um, the first book, Unaccountable, was turned into the TV series The Resident on Fox, which um, obviously there's only so much material in the book. And the writers of the TV show added a lot of great content, took, ran with some of the characters, but it really gets at the issues of accountability in healthcare. And then um, most recently, in, in an attempt to be able to educate somebody on the business of medicine from A to Z, I wrote the book, The Price We Pay, that is just coming out now. Um, and it's an attempt to really say, you'll hear a lot of different things about why healthcare costs so much. There's a lot of mythology and legend and folklore there's a lot of strong opinions that are not substantiated, but let me break it down for you. There are two fundamental drivers of our healthcare cost crisis, and they are number one, the appropriateness of care, and number two, it's pricing failures in the marketplace. So number one, the appropriateness of care, and number two, pricing failures. We have way too much care, some places there's too little care, there's poor access issues. But by and large, the dominant problem of our healthcare system in terms of the appropriateness issue has been too much care. Just look at the opioid crisis and tell me that's not a case in study. It's 50 to 70,000 people dying a year from prescription opioids. I mean, that's a disgrace. So um, the appropriateness issue and then pricing failures are the two issues that I fundamentally explain in the book, The Price We Pay, and then get into what I call the middlemen of healthcare, and it usually is men, but tens of thousands of millionaires who are not patient-facing have been created by our healthcare system. And at some point, we have to look at this and say, okay, it's $3.5 trillion we spend in healthcare, almost one in five dollars in the economy are spent on healthcare. Um, this is a house of cards, and if we don't clean it up, as Iora and ChenMed and Oak Street are cleaning it up, um, we could. This could be the next um, uh, great recession. Here, it's a bubble and it can burst. So I think there's a lot people can do. We put the resources up at RestoringMedicine.org. I would say find a doctor that you get along with. Doesn't matter if it's a friend of the family or somebody you just meet. Heck, I remember. I remember as a student just walking. Of course, I dressed up nicely, but I walked through the hospital, through the surgeon's offices. I didn't even know where I was, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think I was on the third floor or fourth floor of the Wang Building of Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. <laughs> <I've been there. laughs> You've been there. I printed out a bunch of my resumes, mostly with my phone number on it, since I didn't really have much to fill a resume with. And I just stopped by doctor's office after doctor's office and said, I'm around for the summer. I'd be interested in doing research or helping in any way that I can help. Here's my information if Dr. such and such can accommodate me. And guess what? I got a couple calls back and one of the doctors gave me a cool opportunity. And I said, would it be okay in addition to working on this little database if I watched you take care of patients, uh, you know, whenever possible? And, you know, with no formal elective, nothing to sign up for, nothing to register for. I created my own experience. And um, there are a lot of these experiences out there. And I think what you do is you can, you can research a lot about doctors to be mentored by. For one thing, if you're going to work with somebody and do research, type their name. If you want to do research, type their name into pubmed.org and see if they publish. See if they've written two articles in their life or if they've written 400 articles in their life. And if they put, tend to put students uh, on those papers, and that tells you a lot about someone's research productivity. Because if you just ask somebody, hey, do you do a lot of research? They're all going to tell you yes. And they're all going to tell you they're on the brink of a you know, Nobel Prize winning idea. But 
that's sort of the track record that you can look up when you decide, hey, I want to team up with a doctor, but I'm not sure how to find one. The other factor is just who do you have chemistry with? Who's kind? Who do the nurses like to work with? Who, you know, is um, a good mentor? Who has mentored other people? And if you can talk to them, talk to them. And if you can get an opportunity to talk about the deep underlying root issues of medicine with these folks, when you see somebody, when you uh, see a patient with a doctor and you can talk about some of the, uh, the fallacies of American medicine, you talk about some of the problems and see their passion. And if that matches your passion, see if they're passionate about too much back surgery or too much over medicating older people or the root causes of violence that leads to trauma patients showing up in the emergency room. Whatever your passion is, there are ways to sort of screen for it among doctors that you talk to. And never underestimate the value of spending time with nurses and nurse practitioners, even physical therapists, respiratory therapists, EMTs. Sometimes that's an incredible vantage point on the healthcare system. And anything that shows interest and passion uh, those are the qualities that we like to see in in incoming pre-med students. All right. So there you have it. Very interesting discussion with Dr. Marty McCary, again, surgical oncologist at Johns Hopkins and a best-selling author as well. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. I hope it gave you some insight into healthcare, hopefully piqued your interest to want to go explore it and learn some more. Go find some new books. If you have a book that you like about the healthcare system, let me know about it. Go on to Twitter, tweet me at Medical School HQ. Let me know what your favorite book is. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on The Pre Med Years. This is MedEd Media.